There are a lot of Duke Blue Devils down there in Orlando, Florida now. That's right. We know Paulo Bancaro, the number one overall pick in this year's NBA draft. Wendell Carter Jr. just finished up another season in his NBA career starring for the Magic. We're going to discuss all of that on today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils. Let's get to it. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into this Monday edition of Locked On Blue Devils here on July 18th, 2022. My name is JJ Jackson, proudly serving as your host of Locked On Blue Devils. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply coming up on today's show we are so excited to be talking all things orlando magic with my buddy philip rossman reich of the locked on magic podcast if you haven't done so already make sure you follow our show on twitter at lo underscore blue devils i'm on twitter at underscore jj underscore jackson underscore follow the show on youtube subscribe turn on the post notifications same for podcasts. If you're listening on the Apple Podcast or Spotify platform, leave us a five-star rating and type out a written review. The algorithms really like that. So uh, anything you do to help support this podcast is greatly appreciated. So now without further ado, let me bring in my good pal, Philip Rossman Reich of the Locked On Magic podcast. And Philip, thanks again for the time on this Monday. I want to also let our listeners know again that I spent some time with you in the pre-draft process on your show, and uh, most of the basketball world didn't think Paulo Bancaro would be number one overall, and here we are. Now you're getting to come over on Locked On Blue Devils. This is great, man. Yeah, I, I'm happy to have the invite. Uh, I, I I was a big, I'm always a big fan of Paulo Bancaro. It, it may not have been ultimately how I I had had the magic going. Some of that was inside inter- information, some or what I thought was inside information. Uh, but it was a wild week here on here on draft night. But after a couple summer league games, you know, I am I'm smitten again with Paolo Bancaro and, and we're all really excited for September to come around so we can start playing some basketball again. Without a doubt. I mean, it's outstanding uh, what's happening. Yeah, you know, Duke's had another number one overall pick. They've got five now uh, in their school's program history, the most all time and uh, the rich get richer, so to speak. And we're certainly OK with that. Now we've got Paolo playing for the magic. What impressed you most about Paulo Bencaro? You know, honestly, it, it was a lot of it was just the poise that he played with. Um, you know, again, it's it, it's it wasn't totally unexpected because that's that's what we saw a lot at Duke. I mean, the biggest thing that always impressed me about him at Duke was he always a you always knew where he was on the floor and, and just the poise and composure that he played with. Um, but really the biggest thing for me was the passing. Like I, I always thought that he could be a pretty good passer, and I always thought that he'd be a better passer, or he was a better passer than he showed at Duke. But the passing and really the selflessness that he showed throughout the course of summer league. I mean, look, he's passing to Emmanuel Terry. He's passing to Devin Kennedy, Admiral Schofield, RJ Hampton. And those guys are fringe NBA guys. Um, but he was putting passes on the money to them. He was setting everybody up. The, the, the team was just better with him on the floor. And he just looked so comfortable out there on the floor. Like, honestly, by the halftime of the first game, I was just like, I've seen enough. He's he's ready for to play with the big boys. He's ready to play with the men in, in the regular season. Yeah, I mentioned it last week that, uh, that on Locked On Blue Devils that Paulo had been shut down after a couple of summer league games, which is always a great thing. It means you're playing well. And, hey, the Magic understand this is a major investment that they're making in a number one overall pick. So why risk any silly injury or that sort of thing? But as you mentioned, he did play in a couple of summer league games. The first one, notably, was against the Rockets and Jabari Smith Jr., who, you know, everybody in the basketball world thought was going to be the number one guy, ultimately, when it was all said and done. Productivity, Paulo led his team to the Final Four and was absolutely sensational this season, so uh, rightfully deserved to be the number one pick himself as well. 
Tell us about what exactly Paula was able to do in the summer league for Orlando and why they felt it was a good idea to shut him down. Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest thing, and, and, and this I think was the big thing for the Magic, was they were just experimenting with putting him in every position on the floor. Um, you know, he was playing nominal center for good chunks of time. He was he was the he was the nominal center, like there were no other big guys on the floor, but he was bringing the ball up and and kind of running the offense. So the Magic were just really kind of putting him everywhere on the floor and really kind of seeing what he could do. They ran a lot of pick and rolls for him. Uh, a lot of teams in the summer league were switching. So he was just kind of getting smaller players on him and putting them on the block. He was kind of sizing guys up. He was testing out how he could get to the basket. Uh, honestly, like I would have liked to have seen a third game because that second game, he had eight turnovers. He, he made some mistakes, but he was experimenting. I would have loved to see him kind of take that next step and understanding, okay, this is where I can go. This is what I can do. This is where I need to reel things back and make sure I, I'm playing for my team. But nevertheless, like he showed every facet of his game, his ability to get to the basket, his ability to shoot, his ability to create shots for himself, his ability to create shots for others, his versatility. Uh, he, I mean, the magic just put him everywhere on the floor and, and allowed him to kind of, kind of test, test the water out. I mean, he dipped his toe in the water. They saw plenty that they needed to see. Orlando has a, a very recent bad history with injuries. So I, I don't blame them for being a little bit cautious here. Um, you know, I, from what I understand, Paolo is going to go out and play in the crossover uh, in Seattle uh, over the next few weekend uh, in one of the next few weekends. Um, so, you know, he'll get plenty of time on the court. He'll get plenty of time to kind of flex his muscles. And, and, and even to Paolo's admission, he just wanted to kind of test things out and, and kind of get comfortable on the floor uh, in this summer league. He wasn't looking to go out there and win MVP or anything, which, you know, maybe he would have if he if he kept playing. Yeah, that, that second summer league game was just so fun to watch. I mean, the energy and excitement in the building – Paulo has that big lot, uh, block right at the rim, which was just crazy how someone can make a play like that late in the game. And when I came on Locked On Magic in the review process and kind of looking at what this prospect and Paulo could look like, that's one of the first things people discuss is his Seattle ties, right? That is a basketball community that loves every single one of their hoopers. And so a pro-am event each and every summer. And now Paulo, as an NBA player himself, will be participating, and uh, it's only going to help him get better. Let's do this. For Paulo going into his rookie season now, that summer league has gone away, training camp will be here before we know it, and then we're jumping right into the regular season. What kind of expectations do the Magic have, or what kind of expectations do you have in what we could see from Paulo in his rookie campaign? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always a little bit tough to, to, to translate what you see in summer league to, yeah. to, the, to the pros. I mean, I think I think we're going to see some of those elements. Uh, you know, I think we will see Paolo working in the high post, uh, you know, working at the top of the key, working as a playmaker. I think the Magic will move him around. You know, I think uh, the Magic Journal manager was on a, uh, on a podcast with The Athletic and noted that we could see Paolo both as the ball handler in screener roles and as the screener. And I expect the Magic to kind of move him around throughout the course of the season and move him around and really take advantage of his versatility. But, you know, I think the one thing we didn't really see in the summer league, and, and again, this is because, you know, we love Devin Kennedy here. Uh, Devin Kennedy is not Markel Fultz. Um, <laughs> Devin Kennedy is not Jalen Suggs. Um, you know, one thing I think that we will see is Paolo getting easier shots because there are others setting him up too. And I think that's that was the big element that was missing. And maybe one of the reasons why the Magic ended up shutting him down is because they weren't going to learn a whole lot more about how to use him and how to play him uh, because, the, you know, RJ Hampton just isn't a great playmaker, isn't a great ball handler. And so, you know, I think I think, I think, think the Magic are going to feature Paolo Bancaro hev heavily. I, I think that he could very well end up being their leading scorer this year. I think they really do believe that he can be a star. He's got to go out there and prove it, obviously. But they're going to use him in a ton of different ways. They're going to get him point, get him points, get him baskets, get him looks. Uh, on all different spots on the floor and in all different ways. And that's going to keep defenses off balance and hopefully unleash a magic offense that, that is really, that really struggled last year and has really struggled for most of the last decade. So it, it's really, really exciting. You know, I think the magic have a really creative coach in Jamal Mosley, who is going to look for different ways to get him the ball. And so it, it's, it, you know, it's still a bit of a mystery about how this magic team is actually going to operate and function, but um, it's really exciting because there's a ton of possibilities. It's not a limiting thing. It's it's an unlimiting thing. Sure, and a lot of exciting guards. You mentioned a couple of them there, Markel Fultz, Shalen Suggs. You've got Cole Anthony in the mix as well, which is the fun Duke and UNC rivalry. And at Summer League, 
Those guys are talking about it, which is always great when we get that kind of content. And then in the front court, there's somebody by the name of Wendell Carter Jr. that Duke fans absolutely remember from the great season he had uh, as a freshman for Duke. Let's review his season, and we'll do that in just a moment here on Locked On Blue Devils. Today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you could quickly prioritize who you would like to interview and hire. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Moving forward here on today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils, J.J. Jackson alongside Philip Rossman Reich of the Locked On Magic podcast. And Philip, just a quick plug for what you've got going on over at Locked On Magic. I would assume that anytime your team has the number one draft selection, you make said number one draft selection and then get to see him play in summer league in the year that's ahead. You've got a lot of Paulo talk going on right now on Locked On Magic. Is that a fair assumption to make, sir? That 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 is a fair assumption to make. I think it was what three of five episodes last week where were Paulo talk, and, and the ones that weren't uh, uh, did perform nearly as well. Uh, so a lot, everyone's super interested in Paulo Bancaro, and we will be talking plenty about him and how the Magic uh, plan to use him. Uh, I will be trying to catch video of the crossover when whenever Paulo steps on the floor because we're we're all just eager to see him play. Yeah. No, it's super exciting this year that's going to be coming up. But what I want to do now is, is take a look back. In, in the college basketball world, uh, so often we get plugged into what our teams are doing, and Duke fans will let you know that they are actively following the NBA players at the next level. Pretty easy when, when you and Kentucky have the most players across the NBA every single season. You're likely to find a player on almost every team that went to your school. And so this past season – For the Orlando Magic, as we know, Wendell Carter Jr. uh, was a member of the club. Started his career with the Chicago Bulls, and now all of a sudden finds himself as a player of the Magic. Let's talk Wendell, Philip. Tell me, uh, tell me about his season that just finished up. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a really really fun season for Wendell Carter. Um, You know, I think again, I think I think you know the way the NBA is going, um, it's it's become a lot more positionless, and and it's requiring players to kind of expand their skills. And that includes centers. And I think, you know, Wendell Carter, you know, I remember from my draft evaluation of him felt like he was a jack of all trades, master of none. And he went into a system in Chicago that was frankly very limiting. Um, It really felt like they put kind of a cap on what he could do and what they expected him to do and what his role was. And honestly, I think he bristled a little bit against it. And, and, and again, a bad coaching environment didn't help him. You know, again, I, I think it's pretty well documented. Uh, I'm sure your your fan your your fans remember and were frustrated by uh, the Jim Boylan era in Chicago. And and as sometimes happens with rookies, if you struggle that that first year, a, a new guy comes in, and all of a sudden now you're a little bit forgotten. More than anything else, Wendell Carter just needed a fresh start. He needed a coach that would give him some confidence, a coach that would kind of believe in his skills and kind of unlock everything about him. And that's really what happened when he arrived in Orlando. Um, you know, Jamal Mosley, the Magic's head coach, is, you know, kind of a very, he's a younger guy, first off, but he's very much a new wave guy. He's all about the players. He's all about working with the players. You know, he's a player development coach, first and foremost. He was kind of Luka Doncic's guy in Dallas. Um, and so the environment in Orlando was much more conducive to like saying, hey, explore your game. We're going to use you how we're going to use you in all of your skills. We're not going to limit you to just a few skills. So they weren't just focusing on him being a good defender, which he, which he is. They weren't just focusing on him being a back to the basket guy. They wanted to use him all over the floor and and credit to Wendell Carter. He regained his confidence. He worked on his three point shot. He became uh, at least a, 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 I wouldn't say he was reliable quite yet, but he's getting there. Um, he became a three-point shooter, which he wasn't in Chicago and, 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 and really wasn't uh, as much at, at Duke. 
Um, and so that unlocked a whole bunch of his game. Uh, the Magic ran a lot of their offense through Wendell Carter. He was great just making decisions and dribble handoffs, setting screens, uh, just just doing every little thing that the Magic needed him to do. And, and they rewarded him, obviously, with a, with a contract extension before the season began, or just as the season was beginning, um, and, and really bought into what he can bring. At, at this point, you know, I, I would say Wendell Carter probably finished the season as maybe the Magic's best current player. At the very least, he he is a connector. He's a guy that's going to make everyone around him better because he covers three defensively. He's able to guard the Joel Embiid's of the world, which he honestly did a very good job guarding Joel Embiid in their in their limited matchups. Um, but also can step out and guard on the perimeter. Uh, I think the Magic are going to end up switching a lot on the on defense this year, where you know if they're running a screen and roll, Wendell Carter is going to step out and guard the point guard, and, and I think the Magic are very confident that he can guard in space. So, you know. That, that, that draft analysis that he's a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, back on draft night back then, that was probably seen as a negative. Now, as the NBA has evolved, as he's gotten with a team that's maybe a little bit more progressive and, and has you know versatile guys behind him, that's become a plus. That's become a positive. That's become one of his big attractions is they can do anything with him. I, you know, Again, I think that we'll see him setting screens for Paolo Bancaro. I think we'll see him at the high post, cutting, p- making passes down low to Paolo yeah. Bancaro or doing dribble handoffs. Like they're going to use him everywhere and anywhere that they can find an advantage. And, and, and Wendell Carter, you know, last year showed that he can take advantage of all of that. It's going to be a fun Duke to Duke connection that we'll see on the floor out there. Anytime Paolo throws the ball to Wendell or uh, vice versa, taking a look at that draft process for Wendell Carter Jr. And, and to remind folks where we were at when he was entering the league, that Duke team goes all the way to the Elite Eight, was a Grayson Allen floater away from advancing to the Final Four. You look at that front line, it was both Wendell Carter Jr. and Marvin Bagley the third. I mentioned Grayson Allen, Gary Trent Jr. It was a loaded Duke basketball team with NBA talent. And when he was alongside Marvin Bagley the third in the front court, Bagley was getting all the praise and accolades Wendell was just quietly putting in work and had sort of this rather quiet personality. Off the court, personality-wise, when we're talking about how Wendell Carter Jr. has developed in his NBA career, we've noticed the goggles come out. That was something that we weren't (laughs) used to seeing uh, in his college days. But talk a little bit about his personality. Yeah, I mean, this is a young, young team. Uh, The Magic last year, I think, were the third youngest team in the entire league. I I think they're actually younger this season. I think think they're going to enter the season as the youngest team in the league. Um, And it's hard to believe because I think, what, Wendell Carter is, what, 23, 24 years old? He's kind of the veteran of the group. Um, There was was a moment during the season, I forget who it was against, but it was, you know, know, kind of middle, closer to the all-star break of the season, the Magic were were up at the half, were up at the half, and they they've struggled coming out of the locker room, which which a lot of young teams do. And you know, Wendell Car- Wendell noted after the game that you know they came into the locker room before the coaches talked. Wendell stood up, you know, kind of led a discussion, just kind of led a led a you know kind of a focusing of, hey, we need to come out, we need to win this third quarter, we need to withstand that punch, we need to keep this lead, and that was kind of the presence that Wendell Carter had. He's you know, you talk about him being kind of the quiet, the quiet guy. You know, he's a little bit of a connector in my mind. He was someone who stepped up and kind of kept things serious on a team that has a lot of children on it, that has a lot of kids. And, and he's one of the kids too. Don't don't get me wrong. He likes to have his fun too. Uh, but he kind of kept everything really, really serious and, and kind of was the was the 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 big voice in the locker room that kind of when the team needed a needed a big moment or needed to needed to kind of lock in, he was the guy that often locked them in and, and again just makes the right plays, makes the right passes to kind of back up those words. And so, you know, he was very much the the vet. You know, again, it's a young vet. He's not that old, but he was kind of the veteran voice in that in that locker room, at least among the young guys on the team. Where can we see Wendell prove improve this upcoming season? And 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 what ultimately do you think he can be able to accomplish going into another season in his NBA career? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is he needs to needs to continue developing his three point shot. I think he shot 33 percent, which again, first time as a volume three point shooter, first time as a as a comfortable, confident three point shooter. You'll take that's it. that's pretty good. No, that's yeah. that's a really good that's a really good first step. And you know, Wendell Carter was such a threat from the three point line that he was able to get centers to bite on pump fakes. Like like the I often I often tell my listeners like you look. Your three-point percentage is important, but it's not everything. It's the perception of you as a three-point shooter. 
Terrence Ross was a 32% three-point shooter, but every team in the league is scared of him. They, they, they chase him around the perimeter. They don't want him getting hot. They top block him to keep him from even taking threes. Wendell Carter got to a point last year where he would get the ball on the perimeter. Center comes running out on, out on him. He gives kind of this slow motion pump fake, freezes the defender and drives by him. So, you know, I think continuing to develop that three point shot is going to be really, really important, especially if the magic begin to kind of, you know, especially if the magic try to get Paolo Bancaro in the post, um, looking at summer league again, the magic ran a lot of five out sets. They ran a lot of you know, one pick and roll, everyone else on the perimeter kind of spreading spreading the floor. And so I think Wendell's going to have to continue to develop as a three-point shooter to play the way that the Magic ultimately want to play and, and create different kind of pick and roll combinations to get the switches that the Magic that the Magic want. The other thing I think is Wendell still, Wendell's a really, really good defender. He has to continue to establish himself as an elite defender in this league. You know, we, we talk about Wendell Carter and a lot of Magic fans are really, really excited about Wendell Carter. You know, there was talk about the Magic, you know, going after DeAndre Ayton. They were one of the yeah. few teams with, with cap room. You know, there's been at least, I've seen some people talk about maybe trading for Miles Turner. To me, I don't think you do that because I think Wendell Carter can get to that level, can get to the, that that level of play where he's considered, you know, in that group of maybe kind of the second tier of centers. And so I think for Wendell, it's about the consistency. It's about becoming a, a bigger defensive force, a bigger defensive anchor, uh, and certainly having great defenders around him. Franz Wagner's a solid defender. Jonathan Isaac can be an elite defender. Mo Bamba's a great shot blocker. Uh, you know, we saw what Paolo can do when he's engaged defensively. Um, get, you know, having great defenders around him will help, but Wendell Carter's got to be the real anchor defensively for this team. And if he can do that, then he takes another big leap up in this game. Exciting times ahead for sure for the Orlando Magic, featuring Wendell Carter Jr. and now Paolo Banquero. Also, throughout the history of the Orlando Magic franchise, we've seen a couple of other former Duke Blue Devils. Let's have some fun. Let's highlight some of those guys, and we'll do that in our final segment on today's edition of Locked on Blue Devils. Our show today is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news including all of the Major League Baseball scores going on right now. Tonight is the Major League Baseball Home Run Derby. Get all of your updated odds and picks right now at betonline.net. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. Fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. All right, it's our final few moments here on today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils. JJ Jackson alongside Philip Rossman Reich of the Locked On Magic podcast. And I, I want to talk about some of the Duke players that have worn the Magic jerseys over the years. Let me throw a couple of names your way and you take it however you would like to, Philip as uh, we have seen now Paulo Banquero, Wendell Carter Jr. currently on the team. Some big notable ones were, of course, J.J. Redick and Grant Hill, long runs as players with the Orlando Magic. Current Duke men's basketball assistant coach, Emil Jefferson, who was a part of the 2015 National Championship team, played one season for the Orlando Magic. You've got the likes of Corey Maggette, Josh McRoberts, Chris Duhon, Seth Curry even had a cup of coffee with the Magic when he was trying to get established in the league. We've had a couple of Dukies make their way there to Orlando, Philip. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Duke is one of the great basketball programs in the country. I mean, it's a credit to it's a credit to Coach K. Number one, he coaches guys that are NBA ready. I know that there's a little bit of a reputation that Duke guys don't pan out in the NBA, but. You look at the number of Duke guys across the NBA, a number of Duke guys who make an impact in the NBA, a uh, number of Duke guys, frankly, in front offices. You know, you talk about like Elton Brand with the yeah. Philadelphia 76ers, that Duke has a major imprint on the NBA. And then obviously the NBA is imprinted a little bit on Duke from Coach K's time uh, with the with the with the US bas with the US basketball team. But uh it's it, it, you when you draft, you know, you look at certain programs, when you draft a, a kid from that program, you know exactly what you're getting. Um, you know, it, there's a joke going around the magic front, front magic offices right now. It's not just Duke guys that they draft. They draft a lot of Michigan guys too. They have Franz Wagner, they have Mo Wagner, 
You had Ignis Brzezakis. They had Xavier Simpson on their summer league team. Uh, but, you know, when you draft guys from these power programs, you know that, A, they're being coached well. You know that they're being taught the right things. You know they're being prepared for the next level. They're, they're, they're taught the basics and prepared for the next level. And B, you know exactly what you're going to get. You know that they're going to be good. You know they're, they're going to be good kids. You know that they're going to be – they're not going to be issues because Coach K runs his program like an NBA program. He has a high level of expectation for his, for his, for his, uh, for his athletes. And, and, and NBA people know that's going to translate well to the NBA. And, and again, that's one of the reasons why Duke is one of the best programs I, I, in the country is kids know that if I go there, I'm going to be prepared for the NBA. I'm going to be held to an NBA standard very, very early on. And, and that allows them to make immediate impacts when they do get to the league. No, for sure. I mean, and you mentioned all the ties that they've got in the front office, Elton Brand notably with the 76ers, Trajan Langdon's been doing some stuff in the Pelicans front office. Marty Poshis is – there in Denver. Quinn Snyder was an NBA coach this past season and the years prior with the Utah Jazz. He played for Duke, played for Coach K, and now has started his coaching career. Let's go back to those Duke guys that played for the Magic. Well, I, I guess, is J.J. Redick the most notable one for you, Philip, that uh, you have pretty fond memories of? Probably. I mean, all due respect to Grant Hill, you know, I, <laughs> I love Grant Hill. Grant's, Grant's a great dude. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of Magic fans have kind of a weird relationship with Grant um, just because of the injuries that he faced sure. when he got here. He just, he just didn't play enough. There's, you know, I think, frankly, a lot of misreporting about, about what went down. Uh, I, I constantly have to remind people that Grant Hill nearly died trying to play for this team, trying to live up to that contract. It was very unfair to him. Uh, and when they ultimately parted, it was, it was mutual. And, and a lot of fans don't view it as mutual when they, when they should. It was a mutual parting. Grant Hill wanted to move on. The Magic wanted him to move on so they could hand the reins to Dwight Howard and Jameer Nelson. Um, it, it, you know, I, I wish it could have worked out better. And obviously, Grant still makes an offseason home here in Orlando. Is still very involved in in, in the in the Central Florida community. Um, but JJ Redick is probably the biggest fan favorite uh, guy uh, ever. Um, you know, and honestly, it's just it's just his story uh, of of how he kind of established himself in the NBA. Kind of people kind of forget when he came to Orlando. Brian Hill was a head coach. Defense was really his big focus. They played at the slowest pace in the league. And J.J. was not a good defender yet. He was a great shooter, but wasn't an NBA-level defender, didn't have great NBA size, and really struggled to kind of find his footing. I think it was in his second year, he actually requested a trade. He actually, you know, understood he wasn't going to get an opportunity. And the general manager at the time said, you know, hold, you know, we're going to try, but hold on, stay patient with us. You're going to get your opportunity. And J.J. says this all the time. Stan Van Gundy really saved his career. Stan Van Gundy put an emphasis on shooting when he came to Orlando, surrounding Dwight Howard with, with a bunch of shooters, and that fit J.J. Redick to a T. But you're not going to play for Stan Van Gundy unless you can defend. And I know Re I know J.J. credits Stan Van Gundy with teaching him how to play defense. And I always told people this during the Magic's championship run, and, and all the guys on that 2009 finals team uh, you know, is just absolutely beloved here in Orlando. Ray for Alston, Courtney Lee, even kind of some of the back end bench guys are just absolutely beloved uh, <laughs> on, on that team. But, J you know, JJ Redick was such a huge part of that. He wasn't in the rotation the entire season. Courtney Lee gets hurt in that first, in that first game. And JJ comes in to play that or in that first round series against Philadelphia, JJ comes in against Boston. Suddenly he's starting in a second round playoff game. And he's defending Ray Allen. And you can go back, look at the numbers. Ray Allen really struggled in that series. And it's not obviously just an individual guy, but I, I, I remember watching that series and being like, J.J. Redick is defending Ray Allen so well. He, he knows all the tricks because he runs those same screens. He runs those same sets to get himself open. Uh, and, and he did such a great job on Ray Allen. And that's really what established J.J. Redick as, oh, this guy can play. He showed up big time in the, in the playoffs. Uh, he was such a key piece to that team, and his career just took off from there. He was a rotation player the next season, was a fan favorite um, throughout his entire time in Orlando, became a national fan favorite, uh, which is saying something from where he yeah. was at Duke. He no was, was enemy number one. Everybody everybody around the league loves him. He's just such a kind of poised, smart guy. Uh, you know, He always understood his limitations. He played his role perfectly. He made all his teams better. I mean, it's it's no coincidence, uh, maybe a little bit of a coincidence on the early end of it, but it's no coincidence that J.J. Redick made the playoffs every single year of his career except for, what, what the final two, final season of his career. Uh, when, he, when he, you know, again, and he credits Stan Van Gundy a lot for this and certainly credits his time in Orlando a lot for this. He 
he understood what it took to win and understood how to make himself better, knew, understood how to play his role and, and how to help his team win. And, and those are always the guys that are really popular with the teams yeah. that they play on and ultimately really popular around the league because those are the guys that help you win. And he's such a good storyteller, as we've learned in this next phase of his life and his career with the Old Man of the Three podcast, that basketball fan. I don't have to say Duke fans. Like NBA yeah. basketball fans love listening to the content he's got there. He's sharing so many stories about those magic days, talking about his days at Duke where he's the school's all-time leading scorer and uh, has his number four jersey retired in the rafters. I mean, outstanding stuff. And um, I, I would have figured that J.J. Redick would have – although there are some obscure Duke guys that had cups of coffee, like we said, with the Orlando Magic over the years. J.J. certainly the one to go for. Philip, this has been outstanding. I'm so appreciative of the time that we got to spend together here today. Tell me a little bit more about Locked On Magic and uh, what we can expect moving forward. Yeah, obviously we're getting set to, to enter the kind of the quiet phase. So we'll be talking a lot about uh, what the possibilities are with Paolo Bancaro, what the goals are for this coming season. It's you know still a rebuilding team for the Orlando Magic. I think there are quiet hopes that they could maybe make a play in tournament push, but uh, this is still a young team kind of figuring themselves out. It's going to be really, really exciting to watch how everything comes together how the magic ultimately fit with Paolo Bancaro and how they ultimately build. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun to to see this team grow and develop. And and you know, if you're looking for a young team to latch on to, this is the one to join, join, join the magic bandwagon now. And we'll be covering it all at, at Locked On Magic for, for the whole summer. Outstanding. Thank you again for the time today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, JJ. That's my buddy Philip Rossman Reich there with the Locked On Magic podcast. Make sure you check it out, as he said, for all things Paulo Bancaro, Wendell Carter Jr., and your Orlando Magic needs moving forward. That wraps up another awesome edition of Locked On Blue Devils. Make sure you follow and subscribe on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. Like this video on YouTube. Give us a five star rating on your podcast platform of choice. And we'll be back throughout the week with more NBA check ins on our Duke Blue Devils. That's going to do it for today's show. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you later. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.